Hey everyone, Rich Monroe here with BNB Investing Group. Um, we help investors try to build a scalable business, whether you're doing acquisitions, master leasing, or managing uh, other investor properties. And uh, every week we talk to somebody that's successful uh, with short-term rentals and kind of learning their story. And uh, I'm kind of excited today. I've got a good friend of mine on with us, uh, Elizabeth, uh, with Meta Capital. And we're going to kind of do a deep dive on her business and see how it's been going. And and, and kind of learn about the host, the house hacking uh, model if uh, you guys are interested in that. So Elizabeth, thanks for jumping on today. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, thank you guys for joining everybody. Um, so I have a long history in the real estate industry. I was pretty much born and raised in it. Um, when I was in fifth grade, I'm gonna show my age, that was 2001, so 9-11 occurred. My mom was a flight attendant at the time. Um, my dad had a little side gig where he did uh, fix and flips, Section 8, long-term renting. Um, my mom, after being a flight attendant for 20 years, was then furloughed. Kind of sent our family into a tailspin of what are we going to do? So she took out her uh, retirement account early, which she was able to do with the airlines. We ended up investing it into a cabin and within... Uh, less than a year, we had 13 high-end vacation real estate properties. So it was a complete 180 from what I was used to. Um, and it's funny. So you, so you, lit you literally grew up into this then? Oh, yeah. Essentially. Very cool. Uh, I think like eight years before Airbnb was even invented. Back in the day when they would go to www. <laughs> <laughs> type in your website, uh, they would mail a check and we would mail them a key. Wow. So it has changed quite a bit. Uh, Absolutely. And growing up in it, I always saw my mom's business versus my dad's. Keep in mind, my dad did like tax lien auctions. He would get severely distressed properties. Um, we would go to Home Depot and buy their floor unit kitchens, take it to these properties and like retrofit them to make it fit. My mom is like, $600 a night on a private lake. Very, very different models. Um, but it was great growing up in it because I got to see kind of the highs and lows of both. Mm -hmm. And through high school, I worked for my mom. Um, I was her assistant with all of her short term rentals because business was booming at that time. And I kept looking at my dad going, Dad, like, why are you even messing around with this? Why are we chasing down Joe Schmo for this rent check that he hasn't paid in three months? Look what mom's doing. And then 2008 came, which was my senior year of high school. It was the, as we all know, the recession, the big market crash. And I saw how prolific my mom's business had grown, just crumble to almost nothing. Because then no one could afford these lavish vacations. Um, we had 14 mortgages at the time. Sorry, 15 mortgages at the time. Because um, we actually moved and bought a new house, including the house that we lived in before that we started long-term renting. And my parents always told me, don't put all your eggs in one basket. But I quickly learned in 08, all of our eggs were hanging out in, a, in one real estate basket which happened to be the basket that got dropped. Mm. Um, and then I saw this paradigm shift where my dad's business flourished. There were tons of houses um, up for foreclosure auctions. There was tons of distressed properties going up for sale. People were unloading because they couldn't afford, you know, balloon payments or mortgages or whatever. Um, and I think that was the most formative year for me because I got to compare short-term gains, long-term gains, short-term plans, long-term plans, um, you know, how short-term renters treated properties versus long-term renters. And like I said, this is my senior year. So I'm like just about to embark on the world myself, trying to decide how am I going to conquer this <laughs> life? <laughs> and I really started to come up with kind of a mix of the two methods. Um, I really like that my dad offered affordable housing. Uh, mm -hmm. It just spoke to me and my heart. I don't know. I'm a softy. Um, I liked when we would have people that came in that said, like, here's my application. This is why it says this. Please give me a chance. This is what I'll do. And you just see a lot of heart in it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I also liked that he would take distressed properties. He usually bought the worst of the worst and turned them into one of the best. Mm-hmm. And I would see like streets, the whole street get better or whole neighborhoods start to improve because finally the house that's been this issue for 15 years is now this great looking property. Well, I guess I should pick up my property too now. Um, And so I loved that aspect, Mm -hmm. but then I looked at my mom's side and I'm like, but here's where you make the bacon. (laughs) (laughs) Here's what pays the bills. Uh, And so I started kind of this fusion process for myself. So bought my first little condo uh, when I went to college, three bed, three bath, took out student loans for the down payment. Don't tell my loan officer. (laughs) (laughs) Just let it season. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, it was distressed. It was a short sale. The guy selling it was so mad that an 18 year old was buying it that he actually like poured coffee all over it, dumped quick creed into the toilets. I mean, oh, wow. He was real mad. But I had a vision anyway. And so I was like, I'm going to take this one that's not in the best shape, fix it up, live in it myself. One room I had long term renters that I knew were more stable. They had a lease and and that lease was the same amount as my mortgage. Nice. Um, Which seemed insurmountable at 18. It was five hundred and fifty dollars a month with taxes and insurance escrowed. (laughs) Now I look back and I'm like, I wish. (laughs) <laughs> At the time, it was so much money. So 100% and, of your mortgage is, is getting paid by one right. renter. Okay. And then the front room, keep in mind, I still had not caught on to Airbnb at this point. I was using Craigslist ads. Mm. So shot an ad on Craigslist, 50 bucks cash, knock on the door. Here's my address. What are you doing? Thank God I never had two people show up <laughs> on the same night. <laughs> um, but for you know 11 nights easily it would rent so i would make more money short term once i discovered airbnb that ha- that room was packed um mm-hmm. constant turnover um i realized quickly on that i really enjoyed it and so for 4 years i lived for free while going to school and then still allowed- made you probably made extra income too off of it oh right? yeah it, it pretty much supported me Um, Mm -hmm. While I also still worked and I squirreled away money because I knew this is just step one. I wanted to have a house, not a condo was now my next goal. Um, And then I started kind of more room share, strictly Airbnb, two rooms, but same thing. Buy a distressed property, hopefully the worst on the block, fix it up and get more long term goals live in it for two years so I don't have to pay capital gains when I sell. Mm -hmm. And then in the meantime, short term rent. But I got smarter with the second property. I specifically designed it and set it up for Airbnb in particular. It was like a hot thing that was coming through Charleston, South Carolina. Everybody's all excited about the word Airbnb. So when I sold it, I sold it as a business Mm. instead of just as a property. Mm -hmm. So when there was a $50,000 appraisal gap, it was a business and the the buyer was willing to cover that. Nice. Nice. Very cool. So, so all the home sharing, you know, as a, as a young woman at the time, you weren't concerned about your safety and, you know, just random people coming in there in and out of there. That wasn't an issue for you. I mean, I was in college and, and all my friends found their roommates on Craigslist. So like, What's the difference? Your roommate just signed a year lease. They suck and they're here for a year. (laughs) (laughs) Their dishes are piling high. This person, if they suck, they're here for two days, three days. And then you know about your day. Did you have any horror stories or any issues that came up along the way? Oh, no. We didn't practice. Am I supposed to tell the real story? (laughs) (laughs) I had one horror story um, where a guy was super nice. He checked in. He was probably about 10 years older than I was. And I was competitively salsa dancing at the time. Told him, hey, I'd love to hang out with you, but I got to go to bed. I got this competition in the morning in Columbia. Cool. Um, The next day I go to the competition and I look off stage and he's right there. Ooh, stalking. (laughs) And this is an hour and a half away. Like we went from Charleston to Columbia, South Carolina. 
And then he messaged me and he said, I'm a hot and frequent traveler and would love to come back and stay. I'm like, <laughs> all the nose, all the ick. It was so weird. So the whole competition, I'm like trying to dodge him so that I don't have to talk to him. Believe it or not, I was younger and cuter and it, it was more of concern. <laughs> and finally, at the end of it, he like corners me and like, oh, no, I have to talk to this guy. And he's a hot and frequent traveler. And I don't want him to be hot or frequent in my house. <laughs> As it turns out, he was dating this girl who happened to be on the comp like a team we were competing against. Oh, wow. And he was trying to tell me it the whole time, which is why he kept trying to come up to me. And then he messaged me later and he goes, I am so sorry. I meant to say I'm a host and frequent. <laughs> Whoa, that was a scare. Oh, the worst <laughs> horror story was all in my head. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good to know. That's good. But, uh, <laughs> It was it was very interesting to say the least. And I was like, okay, this is so much less weird. Don't worry, we beat his girlfriend's team for the record. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but honestly, I just didn't really have that bad of experiences. My worst That's experience good. ever was a long-term tenant who had a year lease who yeah. just did a bunch of damage. Yeah. Um, and then we had to go through eviction processes and I lived with her. So like, it's really awkward evicting a tenant. It's even right. more awkward evicting your roommate. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can understand that. So, so this next house that you did was actually a house and a bigger one, right? Yes. So now I will fast forward the story because it's kind of rinse and repeat. I don't know. I felt like a little bit of that burr method I wanted to throw in there. Um, I'm now on property number nine. So when my husband and I moved in together uh, six years ago, I before that just had my houses in Charleston that I had two roommates that were Airbnb. But I kept saying, this is a business and I rent one room to live in. Mm -hmm. it makes sense. That's how I kept getting these appraisal gaps. I would also sell the whole house furnished every single time. A, I don't want to move that furniture. B, it matches the aesthetic of the house. I don't want to have to redo this over and over. And C, I get more money. And who doesn't want to redo their house every two years? Yeah, no, that makes sense. After two years, I'm tired of that sofa anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so I continue to rinse and repeat. Uh, six years ago, my husband and I, we moved in together in Metro Atlanta. We're in Stone Mountain. And he was like, okay. I get the whole making money, but I don't like the whole roommate thing. Like we're almost in our thirties. We're a little too past this. So we ended up opting for basement apartments. Mm -hmm. So we're now on house number three together um, with our basement apartment, but same, same concept by distressed, um, preferably a foreclosure or a short sale or tax lien auction. You know, the more distressed, the better. Because A, you want to redo stuff anyway to make it nice, new and pretty. And B, that's where you get more of the, you know, equity built up in the property. Mm -hmm. um, and then set it up for Airbnb, rent the heck out of it, live for free, make extra money. And then every two years, sell it off, sell it as a business and buy the next one. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely it, it. It takes some discipline and commitment to to kind of have that thought process. I know some other investors that do the strategy, and 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 like you, it's almost like addictive, right? You do it once or twice, and it's like, ah, I got to keep doing this. <laughs> well, it's funny so because cool. my husband has lived in like one house his entire life until he met me, and now I'm like, all right, honey, we're moving. Hey, honey, we're moving. So you hey, kind of get accustomed to it, yeah. <laughs> Now he's actually the one that mentioned moving in our current house before I even have. And I was like, oh, now you want to move? He goes, yeah. Did you see our neighbor's house is on the market for 420? I'm like, oh, babe, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so at, yeah. So as you're moving in some case, so you're keeping the house, you're still good. So now when you move out of the, the upstairs unit, you're now going to put that on Airbnb as well, right? Um, so when typically, you keep, when you keep them, or do you typically sell them when you? We move? typically sell the whole thing, 
Mm-hmm. And what's really cool about it is most of the people who have bought my houses have all been first time home buyers mm-hmm. because they are nervous about paying a mortgage. They're typically younger and more open minded to things like roommates. They see that we already have a business in the basement. And so a lot of them are um, kind of diving into house hacking and they're like, wow, this is already done. Like, mm-hmm. I here's your linens and your forks. You don't have to think about anything. Here's your listing. Just So it's actually easier to target that first time home buyer to that market when you're selling as well. You get more offers and works out to be potentially a better price as well. Yes. And it works out well for them because if they are nervous about making mortgage payments, I have a proven business to where your biggest, you know, asset is not costing you money. Your business, Mm -hmm. your biggest asset is now making you money. And it's hard for people who have never had a property to get into the mindset of like, okay, uh, here, I'll give you a great example. Let's say you have someone who wants to buy their first property. Person A lives in their house and they're purchasing their first property. So person A has now two mortgages, two light bills, two water bills, two gas, like double everything. Person B says, okay, I want to get into my first investment property, but I also need somewhere to live. Mm -hmm. So here they are in the same spot, one mortgage, one bill. You can also write off more because you get to write off, you know, whatever percentage of your property you rent. Mm -hmm. So they can write off a portion of their lights, of their water, whereas person A they don't get to do that with their own mortgage. Well, the the other thing too is you're as a primary resident purchase, you're basically, you know, able to take advantage of some of these low down payment programs and potentially mm-hmm. put very little down or 3 or 3 to 5% down, uh, which helps you get in there quicker as well. So that makes sense. Um those of you jumping on, feel free to throw any questions in the chat and we'll uh, try to get to them towards the end. Um so yeah, so besides the house hacking, I know that you've kind of done some some pretty cool things with different niche properties. Um, maybe this is a good time to kind of show show some of us uh, some of your listings as well. Yes, so I have a good many uh, <laughs> listings at this point. I manage about thirty, but I'll show you some of my favorites, and I'll tell you why they're my favorites. Um, So the first one that pops up is my Jeep Wrangler. It's not a short-term rental property, but it is a short-term rental. So I listed on Turo because I had an 08 Frontier. I didn't need a new car. It was paid off. But like, who doesn't want a nice little shiny Tonka toy Jeep to drive around in? Um, And so I kept telling myself, you know, Elizabeth, make the smart decision. However, I now Turo my Jeep. I drive my truck when I uh, do have it to road or if I don't need it. Um, And now my Jeep Wrangler pays for itself in my truck. So so just for the folks that might be watching that don't know what Turo is, you know, Turo is another platform very similar to Airbnb, but it's for vehicles. Right. So you can rent your own vehicle um, instead of it sitting in the parking lot, not making any money. You can actually rent it out to other folks. And it's it's a fairly you know recent platform again with the peer-to-peer lending or peer-to-peer uh, being able to you know rent your own stuff to individuals and so it's another great income generator it's very similar uh, to the Airbnb model because you're basically you could uh, I know folks that do this with higher end vehicles that are you know uh, still making two or three times what their monthly uh, lease payment is on the vehicle and so it's another interesting way to kind of generate additional cash flow and it fits well uh, with the Airbnb model as well. Well, and speaking of fitting well with the Airbnb model, one of the things I now do is when you rent my properties in Atlanta, I send them a discount code for Turo. Or if you rent my truck on Turo or my Jeep on Turo, I turn around and give you a discount to stay in a property. So it feels like this whole service where it's like, oh, wow, this chick is going to, you know, bring me a car, set me up in a listing. My husband and I also do um, Airbnb experiences. So we do kayaking tours and hiking tours. So anything you could need during your short term rental experience will a like I want to go float the hooch and drink a white claw. Like who doesn't? And you're going to pay me to do it even better. Nice. <laughs> I want a new Jeep. Is it the best decision financially? No. Oh, wait, unless I rent it. And then it is. Um, Absolutely. I don't, 
I see a great question popped up. How do you deal with people that trash your vehicle? Knock on wood. Thank goodness. I just haven't had that problem. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's much like Airbnb. They get vetted. Um, they have to show Turo their license, their proof of insurance, things like that. Um, so I guess, you know, Turo also doesn't want to pay for trashed vehicles. So they actually, I think their screening is a little more intense. Cool. Uh, but I'll show you. So a number of listings, you can see a wide variety. Most of these I manage. This first one is my personal baby. Um, again, my husband and I wanted a little cabin for ourselves, but didn't want to pay for it. So now this property um, is on Airbnb and is one of our highest performers ROI wise. Because I work a lot with house hacking, because I have a lot of small li listings and quirky listings, I look a lot at ROI versus actual income. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what you're going to hear me more refer to. What's the ROI on that one? Uh, let's see. Oh, I'd have to run it recently. Um, Just ballpark. I think last time I ran it was around 20%. Okay. That's good. That's um, a good number. So that one does really well, but I've got one in my pocket that is phenomenal. Um, but you can see there's an eclectic mix on here. This is a basement apartment for a friend of mine. Um, her husband was in the film industry and we know film and writers went on strike. They were kind of panicking. How are we going to pay our bills? I was like, don't worry, you have a basement. Um, and so here's their cute little basement. What's also nice is she's from France. When her family would come in and visit, they usually came for a month or two at a time for an extended visit. And instead of you paying for them to stay in a hotel somewhere, she now has space so that she's saving money and not having to rent. Um, this next one is my personal spare bedroom that we're working on right now. Um, so you're still doing room by room rentals despite your husband trying to move you away from that. <laughs> okay, here's my caveat. Here's, my, here's how I get around it. He doesn't wanna rent while we're here. However, what we agreed on is whenever we leave town, we have like combination locks on our master bedroom door and on my office. And we yeah. rent the house as a one bedroom. Okay. And then we that rent the basement. Right? That makes so sense. I get to bring in the extra income and he gets to have his privacy. Little win-win. Very cool. Um, and then I'm also, I like to layer because I do a good bit of house hacking. So like I said, we'll go out of town. We'll usually take his car. That means I don't need my Jeep. I might lower the price on the Jeep to hurry up and get it rented, especially mm -hmm. with someone who's staying at our house. You just park it right back here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're interested in renting the basement. I'm going to give you a discount if you'll rent the upstairs room too. So it's just one family staying on the property. Um, next to my house, which I just took it off the other page. So I'm going to flip to this page is Rosie, the retro camper. This cool. is my highest ROI. Okay. Uh, I think when I ran numbers, oh gosh. Well, I'll give you the numbers and then you guys can, I'm like, I'm blanking now. Of course, now that I'm on the spot, I should have jotted something down. <laughs> um, but my husband and I bought our house. Again, it was completely distressed, vacant for 22 years. It was the notorious one on the block that it was boarded up and just like the police hated us. Our neighbors hated us or not us, but the property. Um, and when we were buying it, the number of people who said like, you are insane. Why would you ever buy this house? Um, in fact, it was in such disrepair that we were never even hooked up to utilities. We didn't have water, electricity. We had to run all the plumbing, everything. This mm. house was just discarded. Mm -hmm. um, I guess they were hoping it would eventually collapse in on itself. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. It spoke to me. Um, however, that means you have a lot of renovations to do. Mm -hmm. In fact, we are 17 months into owning it and we're still changing little things here and there. Um, still not a hundred percent done, but for the first 10 months, our house was completely unlivable. Mm -hmm. 
So we could have rented. Maybe we got a great deal, a thousand bucks a month, which for two people and two dogs in Stone Mountain furnished, like you're not going to find. But let's pretend we could have. Mm -hmm. It would have cost us $10,000 for those 10 months. Mm -hmm. Or we could buy a camper for nine grand, Mm -hmm. live in it. We're already $1,000 positive at this point. We moved out of it. And then we started renting it on Airbnb. This little baby makes um, between... 2,500 to 2,000, maybe 1,500 on a slow month. Mm -hmm. But you can see super cute, little tiny, efficient, sufficient. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's the nightly rate? 40 bucks a night. 40 bucks a night. And this is in Stone Mountain? Yep. Okay. It's parked next to our house, uh, like in the little side yard. Mm Mm-hmm. So you can see it's got a little bathroom. You can see part of our house right here. Um, So $40 a night plus a $40 cleaning fee and a $40 pet fee. And I'll tell you, every single person that comes stays and has a pet. So now it's actually $80 a night. We get a lot of one night stays. We get a lot of people who are hiking the mountain. Also, our guests are like the lowest maintenance possible. Like no one... No one who's super bougie is staying in a camper to begin. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that makes so, perfect sense. I love it. And and you guys as investors, your next rehab project, if it's out of town, you can definitely park that thing and, and get it done. Well, That's awesome. We take love it, it all over the place. When we go visit my husband's mother-in-law, as I like to refer to my mother as, <laughs> <laughs> we take the camper so that we have our own space. So again, we're not having to rent when we go travel. We travel a good bit. I go to all these properties I manage. Maybe we'll stay in it. Maybe they're booked. Um, Saves us money there. We've had her up for um, a little over a year. So I would say in that year, we've probably made $15,000 profit in addition to saving the money that we didn't have to spend while renovating. Now I'll tell you, and Rich can probably attest to this, When Rich and I first met, I was living in the camper. Right. And uh, talking to some other investors, they're like, are you insane? Like you have two (laughs) people and two dogs living in 16 square feet. One It it looks looks comfortable. (laughs) It's tight. (laughs) But it's not everything we needed. And what I learned personally was the more that I am willing to kind of put myself out, the more that I can grow my own wealth. So do I love having like a roommate next door to me at all times? Not necessarily. However, if that's going to give me the cash flow I need to go to South Africa for two weeks, like, yeah, I'll put up with it. Makes sense. Um, My husband makes fun of me all the time because we do not own a towel or a set of sheets without stains on them. Mm Mm-hmm. You have, the, you have the stuff that you pull out of the Airbnb. Exactly. Yeah. We, we do the same thing. <laughs> when it's not good enough for my guest. Right. Me, I know it's right. clean. It's just stained. Yeah. And yeah. he always makes fun of me. He's like, when are we going to have a towel that doesn't have like r- Georgia red clay? And I said, I hope never. Because right. when I buy it, it's a business expense. Mm-hmm. And then when I take it out and put it in our house, that's a donation. Yep. And then when I rebuy it for the rental, it's a business expense again. Yeah, makes sense. So we haven't touched on this, but, you know, obviously uh, another man- another revenue stream that you're kind of tapping into here is managing properties for other investors. And so um, let's touch a little bit on that. How did you get into that aspect of it? I mean, you know, we do the same thing in our business. So um, I recognize the the value of throwing everything into the same operation. You've already got everything set up and running for your own properties. And so it's a, it's a natural progression to be able to add that into the mix. And, you know, what are you typically charging as a management fee for those properties as well? Well, first off, nobody warned me. It was a natural progression. It was an accident (laughs) for me. (laughs) I fell into it and I'll open up my, uh, screen here and you guys i think have access to my website feel free to steal borrow beg whatever you want from here i was a teacher for 13 years so i'm well aware that it's easier to work off the shoulders of other people 
So feel free. Yeah, I'll um, throw that in the chat, guys, for her website so everybody has access to it. Yeah. Um, so I started because friends of mine saw me doing well on Airbnb. Um, they were trying it themselves and they just something wasn't clicking um, or they didn't have the time or they didn't have the design aesthetic. It's like, no, you can't actually still throw an air mattress in your living room. Like, I know that's where we started, but we're past that now. Sorry, Brian. Um, <laughs> although my very first listing ever, ever on Airbnb was my pullout living room sofa with an extra air mattress for the record. That's, that's just like the founders of Airbnb. Look at you. It, you know, we were all poor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so I started off by like trying to just help friends and then the word of mouth grew and I realized, okay, there's a need for con consulting here. Mm -hmm. So I got into consulting and then eventually I learned there are some people who just won't ever do it or want to do it. And that's when I started taking on more management. Um, I was still a seventh grade science teacher by trade in my heart. Um, and then during COVID I realized I didn't love it the way I did before, um, you know, not being able to hug your students, not being able to share science supplies and do labs. All the things I loved the most were were taken away. Mm -hmm. And my husband said, you know, you have like a line of people at the door asking you to Airbnb their property. Why don't you just give it a shot? Um, I struggled from imposter syndrome. I thought there's no way I could possibly do this. There's mm -hmm. no way will pay me to do this. Um, do I know enough? Am I, you know, like just every self self doubt you could have where you're like, do I have the capital? Do I have the insurance? Do I have the know how? Do I have the bandwidth? Am I good enough? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is that diving too much into personal anxiety? But it's true. <laughs> and I just kept thinking, but no, I'm a teacher. That's what I am. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. So I told my husband if um, I had six properties that I was managing at the time, if I could get four more and have 10 by uh, summer break, that I would feel comfortable leaving the classroom. Nice. Um, but I was like, you know, OK, that seems pretty lofty. Like that's almost double. And it's like February and we're talking about May. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK. Any of my friends, if you need help, now's your chance. And I had 30 properties by the end of summer. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so it, it took off. And then that kind of pushed me into my next venture that I'm even newer in, but have really enjoyed, which is more designs. So before you, you shift gears into that, Elizabeth, yeah. I noticed you have an, an international option on there to... Uh, basically handle a lot of the technology on uh, on a listing and kind of managing remotely. Um, do you have any international clients right now that that you've got set up on that particular service? I have one international. We have not gone live yet. They're in the Dominican. Um, the best part was getting to visit the property because, you know, I got to know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a business expense. Um, <laughs> But I do have properties from uh, L.A. to Cedar Key, Florida, Chicago, Connecticut. So all across the U.S. Very it's cool. really once you learn to remotely manage like undrivable distance. So once you hit that, you're like, all right, you're four hours away. I can't drive there. Then there's not that much difference no matter where they are in the world. Yeah, like you I still agree. Can't get there. Mm hmm. Um, but a lot of it is setting up um, fail safes. I'm very technological. So I use um, tech stacks. Turno is probably the biggest one that I use, but even like Instacart. Okay, sorry, the tissues ran out. Instead of me trying to chase down a housekeeper or do this or do that or whatever, I'm just going to Instacart it to you. Yeah, we, uh, we use the heck out of that as well. It's, yeah. it's, the, best, it's the best thing ever. Um, I had someone today who checked in and said, hey, the lawn is getting long. Like, OK, you're right. We haven't set up our lawn service yet. It's just starting to get warm again. This is here in Atlanta. Like, cool. Task rabbit. Your lawn guy will be there in 28 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so once you get into that mindset, honestly, at this point, it doesn't matter where in the world a property is. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So you're all, you're also helping folks with design. Yes. So, um, like I said, I kind of was pushed into management and was like, oh, wow, there really is a need here. There really are people who don't want to do this or or aren't comfortable doing it. Um, and, you know, when I think about it, I've been with Airbnb uh, in particular for 11 years. There is a learning curve. I have 11 years of experience and, uh, and seen a lot of changes in the platform in the meantime. Someone else could easily do the same job that I do but not without that learning curve. Yeah. So yeah. really all I'm doing is flattening that and making it more seamless. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I wish there had been a me <laughs> back when <laughs> I was first starting. Trial and error. Uh, tr trial and error. So yeah, learn from someone else's mistakes. That's mm -hmm. my biggest piece of advice. Don't learn from somebody else's. Um, and part of learning from other people's mistakes was I would tell people, yes, I would love to manage let me know when the house is ready to go and then I'll start. And I kid you not, one of the first properties um, that I managed professionally in Atlanta, house indicator, large house, beautiful house. The guy was so proud of his design. It was gorgeous. But I walked into a $7,000 crushed velvet uh, sectional that had like little buttons with divots. Mm hmm. And I just can't imagine a worse sofa for a short-term rental. <laughs> like, first off, you spent how much? Second off, it's velvet. It was literally like a lint roller. <laughs> wow. And then you, gotta... you have divots. I have to vacuum out every single one. That's insane. Well, then you got to get your little brush out when you're done and brush it, right? <laughs> right. And like, you couldn't even touch it without leaving like a streak of handprint. I'm like, oh, I got to wipe it down again. <laughs> And so then I realized, okay, there's actually a need for design. So then I went to what made the most sense to me again, because again, my imposter syndrome, I thought there's no way I can possibly do this on my own. I worked with an interior designer, hired her, or I would work with her and the clients would hire her. She would do the design, gorgeous properties. Mm -hmm. But again, now I'm getting like white linen sofas in a short-term rental. I'm like, wait, 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 guys. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what I meant either. <laughs> and so eventually I learned there's a difference between long-term rentals and short-term rentals. There's a difference between, uh, you know, long-term rental properties, how you design them and how you design short-term rental properties. Um, and so I really started to dive into design. So these are all properties that I've done at this point. Um, but you'll notice kind of a theme in a lot of them and I'll show you first and then I'll explain to see if you guys pick up on the theme. I'll give you a hint. I did not choose these sofas. Um, but this has been a lot of fun because it really allows me to set the properties up for success from the beginning mm -hmm. so that I'm not getting a crushed velvet divoted sofa where I'm like, what the heck am I going to do with this? Right. So I guess from the main photos, some of these might be hard to pick out, but I learned, um, for instance, I put as big of a bed as possible will fit in a bedroom. People like king beds. A kid can sleep in a king, but two adults can't sleep in a twin. Um, mm -hmm. I went for um, sectionals. All sectionals is a big yep. one for me. Faux mm -hmm. leather, preferably. We can tell I did not pick this one. This was actually another black velvet sofa that was one of the ones that showed me I need to learn to start designing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do a lot of non-porous surfaces. I do not do a lot of rugs. I don't do a lot of curtains. I try to take out as many linens as possible and instead go for like jute or um, blinds or roller shades. Mm -hmm. um, if you do have a sofa, maybe I'll throw a slip cover on it. Things that are easy to wipe down, things that yep. are easy to replace. Um, I use a lot of modular sectionals so that if a guest does come in and they poke a hole in your seat, or I don't know how many of you have dealt with this, the famous like cigarette burn in the armrest. I've seen it mm -hmm. too many times. 
Yeah. Now the sectionals that I use, pull that piece off, throw it away, pop the new one in, move on with your life. Love it. Love it. That's a huge pro tip. Love it. Yes. Um, and so, you know, with this, I can definitely take um, a property and set it up for success from the beginning. It's easy to clean. It's easy to replace. I like using Amazon because if something does break, I can ship two days, ship something else in its in its place. Um, as many non-porous surfaces as possible because you can use bleach or you can sanitize. They don't absorb stains or smells or whatever. And I go into a whole thing, um, even down to like bath mats. I prefer to use bamboo bath mats because they don't have to be laundered between every guest. Mm -hmm. um, so now I've taken this business that started as like, oh, come hang out in my spare bedroom because I'm poor and I'm tired of eating ramen <laughs> again tonight. And I've turned it into here is an entire property that is completely empty. So I work with a lot of realtors who have investors. I will design it. I will furnish it. I will assemble it. I will put everything in place. When you walk in the door, it is a fully functioning rental. And then I'm going to manage it for you because I know it better than you do. And that has been the most successful um, method for myself up to this point. Very cool. Very cool. Let's take a couple of the questions. Um, yeah. The recent one is, do you arbitrage? So I do not personally. Um, arbitrage can be a great method. It's just not my method personally. Okay. This is from uh, actually one of our, our clients that just got super host today, I believe, Terry. Yes. Yeah, she said, this lady is speaking my language. <laughs> um, I'm glad somebody well, understands me. Yeah, yeah. One, no, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, this one says, my husband wants to buy a B&B in. How would you start in a tiny home or something in distress? So I would start, and I'm a very conservative investor. So maybe I'm like not the best investor, <laughs> um, but I start with something that I can afford, even if it doesn't rent a single day. So like my houses, I qualified with just my income. I don't use the basement income to qualify, but I'm like, here's what I know I can afford because let's say something crazy happens. I don't know, like a world pandemic and shuts down travel. <laughs> I want to know that I'm okay. So if you're looking at a B&B &B or an inn, I would try to figure out what can you reasonably handle, especially if you're just starting out. Once you've got steady streams of income and you've got multiple properties and it's OK if one sits empty, not as big of a deal. If your portfolio you know, has that room for flexibility, great. Mine doesn't. So mm -hmm. um, I try to say, like, OK, what can I afford? What can I handle renovating? You know, if you have two full time jobs and five kids, like maybe a renovation isn't the best method for you. Maybe yeah. it's better to get something that is an arbitrage or is, you know, more put together so that there isn't that time and effort for myself. I don't know. I love I love renovations. I love sawdust. Um, I put me in a tile store and I'm happy for the rest of my life. <laughs> but you got to do what you enjoy and what energizes you. Absolutely. So this was from the Turo conversation earlier. Uh, what coverage does Turo give? What is the oldest vehicle Turo allows? So um, coverage wise, they have different packages. You can actually choose no coverage if you're just like YOLO out in the world. Um, and then they have higher options. I have the second to highest one and I wish I could quote it to you right now, but I'm blanking. Um, but I think it cover. I think I have like a three thousand dollar deductible, um, but they have zero deductible options all the way up to no coverage at all. Um, yeah, we we I used to do Turo several years ago um, before COVID with some of our Midtown Virginia Highland properties and did quite well. But I kind of got tired of the operational aspect of it. You got to have runners to go pick them up and deliver them and you know clean them and then get them ready is a lot of people want to pick it up at the airport, even though we tried to push them to get it from the Airbnb rental. So it just kind of got a little bit much for me at, at the time. We had maybe two or three that we had running on it, but it's, it's a great revenue stream if you can kind of figure out the operational challenges for sure. Yep. And see for myself, because I'm, I do more of a house hacking method, 
all of my stuff is right on this one property. We got a camper mm -hmm. outside. We got a basement. We got a spare room. The Jeep is in my driveway. Um, I could see how expanding it wouldn't make sense. Yeah. But, it's not a good, it's not scalable. It's not a good scalable. <laughs> business, Unless you have people who just love like driving and cleaning cars. Right. <laughs> I don't. Uh, yeah. So I, I tried to delegate a lot of that stuff to my sons, but it, it got, even for them, it got old after a while. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I'll tell you some of my first housekeepers were all my students. So when I oh, lived nice. in Charleston, um, I would hire my students a, because they lived walking distance to the property um, B, they wanted jobs. C, they just got so excited that they're like, I mean, one of them in particular was like the breadwinner for his family in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you can find a team, it doesn't necessarily have to be all professionals, but as long as they like show up, do what they're supposed to do, follow directions well. And I say that because now we have a neighbor who's uh, in the high school and he's the one who vacuums out my, my truck. To Turo. There you go. And in exchange, he gets to take his girlfriend out on dates every other weekend in my Jeep. <laughs> That's a perfect barter. Perfect. Works so, for me. <laughs> yeah. So I, before we get finished up here, um, you also do consulting where if uh, somebody has either, even if it's not a house hack, but let, you know, since you you kind of specialize in that, if somebody wants to do house hacking and you're buying your first property. Uh, that's something you can help with. You also help people that just want to learn how to do how to do this. Um, oh yeah, you know. And so, so how do they? How do folks get more information on that? Um, so the easiest way is to go to my website, and you can schedule a consultation with me. Um, some people just have standing, like once a week or once every other week consultations. Where, um, like, I have one owner who I don't know why she just <laughs> she still sets up a meeting every week. Um, but usually she's just saying like, hey, Elizabeth, this is the message I got. Is this the best way to respond? What would you have done? Why did this mm -hmm. damage claim not get accepted? How could I avoid this in the future? So she just kind of does like a weekly recap with me every week. Yeah. Um, I have other people who want me to actually like do a Zoom call and see their house. I do mm -hmm. in-person consultations if you're within a driving distance of Stone Mountain um, so I'm pretty variable on those and I kind of fit the needs of what people ask for because mm -hmm. I do management, I do design, I do, you know, setups, what have you. Um, so whether I also do a lot of, um, uh, triage. So people will come to me and say like, Hey, I got a 3.0 rating. Like, what do we get? Where do we go from here? I just picked yeah. up another triage case that's, uh, in Pine Lake right now that mm -hmm. they're like, what's missing? Like, please help me turn this business around. Those are probably my favorites because yeah. um, they're not usually investors. It's like new people, they have one property and they just, it's like, I really want to do it, but what are we not doing yeah. right here? So, um, so Elizabeth, Elizabeth and I, even though we've known each other for a while, we just discovered that, you know, her clients are, are you know, definitely perfect for folks that don't want to work with well, with what with what I do, you know, our focus with BNB investing is, you know, typically investors that want to grow a scalable business, get to 10, 15, 20, 30 units, um, you know, generate a whole uh, income stream and, and a new business, maybe moving away from fix and flipping or or, you know, kind of, you know, creating a new uh, income flow where her folks are kind of quite the opposite. They just want to do one property or maybe two. Uh, and so, you know, if you're interested in building a scalable business and you're ready to take action, reach out to me. Um, if you want to just start with one property and kind of take it slow, then Elizabeth's your 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 gal, right? So yeah, um, and then hopefully I'll pass you to Rich once you get the systems. Because the hardest part is the systems and the processes and what do I do when and what is a pattern. Once you have your first couple down pat, like even with my houses, at this point it's just a, a rinse and repeat pattern. Um, yeah. So come to me if you want to learn the pattern. Go to Rich when you're ready to really throw it into gear. Absolutely. I think we got one last question before we go. Uh, do you live in a subdivision with an HOA that allows the camper? So I'm not in a subdivision, but our city limits do have restrictions. Fortunately, because of Stone Mountain Park, they do allow campers up to 14 days. So as long as my guests cannot rent for more than 14 days, then they're fine. Makes sense. 
And I noticed you had, um, we didn't talk about it, but you also rent uh, like a, a pad for a camper as well, right? Where someone could just yes. bring their own. Well, and I actually rent one of my own. Um, so when we leave town and we take our camper, obviously I'm not just going to let it sit there and not make any money. <laughs> I list next door to our house as an RV pad while we're out of town. So other people bring their RVs in. Nice. Like, hacking, hacking everywhere I can in this house. People it, told me it, it. I was insane for pouring all the money into it that I did, but I knew we would be cash flow positive almost immediately, which we are. Um, cool. And then this is a cabin in Tennessee. Um, he had an RV pad in the front that he actually was talking about just like closing up because he didn't think anyone would rent it. And I now rent it on Hip Camp. If any of you are familiar with Hip Camp, uh, much like Airbnb, but it's a little niche. It's more for like tents, yurts, campers, RV pads. Um, but you can actually rent RV pads on Airbnb as well. Love it. Love it. No, that's that's awesome. I mean, you've you've pretty much got any different angle that you can think of to generate <laughs> revenue. Love it. <laughs> yep. And it, it but, really goes back to my parents and watching them have such good ideas, but they were so pigeonholed mm -hmm. where I was like, you know what, dad, your fix and flip makes sense. Mom, your short term rental makes sense. But wait, how does this make sense when we're here or when we're there? And I want no matter where I am, whether I'm at home, whether I'm on vacation, whatever, to be making money. Um, and if I'm not making money, at least I'm saving money because a penny saved is a penny earned. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hope everybody enjoyed today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, yes. I'd, I'd, I'd love to have you back at a later date and kind of get an update on how things are going with your growth. Um, what is your growth? Where do you where do you plan on being in the next couple of years? Are you trying to get more more uh, management clients, more properties? What is your your goal? So I just hired my first full time employee, which has been a big, exciting step. Um, so that I can make more room for management because for me personally, 30 to 35 is my bandwidth. Um, I have been looking into a lot into tech stacks so that I can scale my business um, because without technology, you, you really are limited. Yeah. Um, and so I'm diving a lot into that. I probably won't really change the way or the type of listings that I manage because this is what I'm passionate about. I've never like looked and said, oh, I want luxury or I want hundreds of properties. I want to help people who otherwise couldn't afford their lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. That's really where I was at 18 with a house going, oh my God, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? Um, and that that's really where I want to stay. Love but it. I hope Makes to help sense. more people. Very cool. Well, and thanks Gen again, Z. Elizabeth. Gen, <laughs> Gen Z. Z's don't need all the help they need with their Oh, husband. yeah. They certainly are. <laughs> well, thanks again so much for joining, everybody. Um, thanks again, Elizabeth, for your time. And we'll uh, we'll talk again soon. Nice to meet everybody. Take care.